another reason. Narratives about infectious diseases show that evolution matters. Evolution is not just a story about where we came from. It's an integral part of biology and medicine. This is Stuart Levy and Tufts. Uh, Stuart Levy is famous for working basically on acquired resistance to antibiotics, which are now plaguing us as bacterial diseases we used to knock out with penicillin are now resistant not just to penicillin, but to streptomycin, ampicillin, and just about any drug you can name. And Levy, in one of his articles, wrote that medicine and public health would be way better off if we taught med students as much about Darwin as we teach them about Pasteur. Because the problem with antibiotic resistance is an evolutionary problem. And physicians have to be aware of it for the future. Um, just to give you an example of this, um, JBS Haldane was one of the, the sort of the founders of what's known as the Neo-Darwinian theory of evolution. He worked in Britain from about 1915 until 1940. Um, he's responsible for trying to integrate Mendelian genetics and biochemistry into evolutionary theory. His classic book is The Causes of Evolution. And Haldane pointed out that natural selection is driven by a whole bunch of different forces. And these include availability of food, actions of predators, the physical environments. But Haldane was the very first to appreciate that disease has something to do with it as well. This is something, frankly, that Charles Darwin overlooked consistently in his writings. But it's very clear that disease does, in fact, drive evolutionary change. So infectious diseases, in particular, are major drivers of evolutionary change. So here's an example. And this is not an infectious disease. But this is a disorder that you know about because it's a classic genetic disorder we talk about all the time. And that is sickle cell anemia. In this country, we associate sickle cell disease with African Americans. And there's a very good reason for that. The majority of African Americans can trace their African ancestry to the west equatorial coast of Africa, where the slave trade was concentrated. Uh, and as it turns out, the sickle cell allele, as you can see, is very common in this area. But the sickle cell allele around the world is found in other areas as well, including the Arabian Peninsula and the Indian subcontinent and areas around the Mediterranean. So what is it that has driven the evolution, if you will, of a human variant of hemoglobin? Well, I think you already know the example that drove this, and that is the prevalence of malaria. And it turns out that individuals who are heterozygous for the sickle cell allele have a high degree of resistance against malaria. So although two copies of the sickle cell allele are still bad news for you no matter where you live, having a single copy actually renders you resistant to malaria. Mm -hmm. And European settlers, particularly the British, who began to colonize equatorial West Africa, found this out very quickly when they got sick and sometimes died from malaria and they could not <coughs> understand why the native populations literally just brushed off mosquitoes and didn't worry about them. And it turns out, again, the reason historically we have the sickle cell among certain populations in the United States is these populations can trace their ancestry to areas where malaria was common. And in those places, the sickle cell trait, uh, sickle cell allele, actually turns out to be advantageous. So that's a perfectly good example how the pressure of an infectious disease, and that's what malaria is, drove human evolution. Now, it turns out it's not the only example. So I want to point out one that you may or may not know of. And I want to start out by saying that uh, studies of infectious disease provide powerful examples of science in action today. So Hardy Sabata um, is one of the people I want to talk about. Um, she is the lead singer in a band called Thousand Days. Uh, you can find it on iTunes. Uh, really good music if you like sort of heavy metal type rock. Um, what else? Uh, does Pardis do in her spare time? Well, in her spare time, she turns out to be an epidemiologist at Harvard Medical School. Um, and she's done remarkable stuff. She climbs mountains, she rollerblades, she surfs, she sings in this band. Uh, extraordinary woman. Um, uh, but what does she do uh, uh, when she's not entertaining? Well, the answer is she works on evolutionary pressures in human populations. So what is one of her most important papers studied a cholera epidemic in India, the Ganges, Ganges River. Uh, and it turns out she was able, uh, and her team, to find a couple of very interesting things. And that is the population in the Ganges River Delta today has, among all the populations of this planet, 
the lowest known incidence of blood type O. Uh, about 40% of Americans are blood type O. I'm blood type O. Um, the, uh, um, but it turns out they are less than 5% blood type O in this area. So what's the reason for that? Well, an evolutionary biologist would immediately say, must be a selective advantage um, that basically conferred to A, B, and A, B. And it turns out that's the case. There's strong positive selection for resistance to color. And people with blood type O, for reasons which are still not clear, are uniquely susceptible to color. So it turns out the blood type O has pretty much been weeded out in this area by the cholera bacillus itself. Now later on, um, I'm going to say a little bit more about cholera, and I'm going to ask you to look at two classroom exercises investigating cholera, and I passed out handouts uh, on the table for this, but we'll get to cholera in just a second. Uh, I want to let you know um, that uh, basically this researcher has not stopped. Her lab is now working on Lassa fever virus, which is a virus that spreads in certain areas of Africa. And they've already found out some absolutely remarkable things. Uh, so for example, this is um, the, what's called the graphical abstract of her most recent paper in the journal Cell. That's the structure of Lassa fever virus. Uh, papers in Cell, important papers, now always have a graphical abstract. Basically, um, cell, cell is the most prestigious journal in my field. Okay? Uh, I got a cover story in the journal Cell a few years ago. It was great. Got me promoted to full professor. So this, is, <laughs> this journal is a big deal. And you might think, all the papers now have cartoons in front? <laughs> well, actually, yeah, because it actually helps scientific understanding. Uh, but what they discovered, first of all, um, is it has a diverse and ancient origin in the country of Ni Nigeria. Um, there are two different viral strains. The virus itself evolves to evade immune determined selection pressures. And one of the things that they discovered was that nearly all the patients they studied have been contaminated by feces from a little mouse uh, called Mastomyces natalensis. And that mouse functions as a reservoir for persistent infections. It's a cute little mouse. Uh, it's all over this area. But it turns out this is a disease that moves back and forth between these rodents and human beings. And in fact, in an underdeveloped country, like many of the countries in Central West Africa, it's very difficult to keep rodents out of food preparation areas, sanitary facilities, and so forth. And this is the reason for basically loss of fever being endemic in that area, is that you have an animal reservoir. 